We're going to move on to chapter six here to talk about telescopes and more generally astronomical instruments. Here's a, an image, an artist's impression of the Hubble Space Telescope. It's got solar panels to keep it going. It's been running for more than 25 years now. Um, it's still doing great work. It's outlived its hardware expectation. Now the telescope was invented in 1608 and it was first used by Galileo Galilei just over 400 years ago in 1609 to do astronomical observations. He observed the phases of Venus. He looked at the moons around Jupiter. Um, he looked at the craters on our own moon and so on. And he published his results in this dialogue concerning the two chief world systems in which he presented the evidence for an earth-centered, not a sun-centered model of the universe. The Roman Catholic Church didn't take kindly to the book, and they basically put him on house arrest uh, until he passed away. Now, one advantage of modern telescopes is that they are not limited to just visible light. Here are different images of the Orion constellation in the visible on the left, in x-ray in the middle, in the infrared on the right. And uh, yeah, they look quite different from one another. And we are able to learn different things by looking at the sky in different wavelengths. Now, in general, bigger telescopes are better because of two reasons. One, the bigger the telescope is, at least in terms of its aperture size, it's not as important how long the telescope is. What's really important is how big it is in diameter, because that tells you a couple things. Firstly, how much light can it collect? The broader the aperture, the more light that you can get. And therefore, the more details you can tease out in whatever it is that you're looking at. The second thing, and this also gets better as you have broader apertures, is what's called angular resolution. Think of that as being how blurry an image is. I could have two telescopes that were equally large, but maybe one, you know, um, was made by the best lens crafters in the uh, planet. And the other was just, you know, some cheap plastic that somebody cut and, you know, not really that good. They're both really big, but one's going to give you a blurry image because the lenses aren't cut nicely, etc. And the other could give you a nice sharp image. One has a good angular resolution and one has a poor angular resolution. So you can think of angular resolution as being a measure of how blurry or sharp an image is. So to um, talk about the basic kinds of telescope designs, there are two main types. There are refracting telescopes and there are reflecting telescopes. So a refractor like the one on the left there is built around lenses. Lenses refract light. That refraction is the fancy term for the bending of light as it goes from one medium, say the air, into another medium, say a lens. I've got a couple of lenses here for us, right? And in a sense, I wanna make the point that a telescope is not really anything that crazy or special other than just having two lenses. At least a refracting telescope is just based around there being two lenses. I'm gonna go ahead and turn off the background here so that there's no trickeries. And there you can see behind my shoulder, is a picture that my daughter, Abby, drew. And so let's go ahead and um, take these two lenses. One of them is gonna serve as the eyepiece. That's the lens that's close to your eye. The other lens we'll call the objective lens. And what happens is the light comes through the objective, it gets bent, it comes through the eyepiece, it gets rebent, and you end up basically seeing a magnified image. Also note, it'll be upside down. So let's see if I can do this here. I'll put the eyepiece in front of the webcam and let me try to hold that still. And uh oh, I need to line this up. Now I need to move it to the right location 
Oh, whoa, look at that little bird there. It looks upside down, doesn't it? Oh, upside down bird. And let's see how big it looks right there. Is that a toucan? Perhaps. Oh yeah, it looked a little bigger when I looked at it through those two lenses. And it was upside down. So what's going on here, why it was upside down, you can kind of see from this diagram, right? Imagine the light from the bottom part of the image. It comes through the objective, it gets bent, it passes through what's called the focal point right there. And then that light that used to be on the bottom of the image is going to hit the top of your eyepiece. And then it gets straightened out. What really is happening is you make an image of whatever it is you're looking at right here. And then you use the eyepiece like a little magnifying glass to look at that image. But the light from the bottom ends up on the top. The light from the top ends up on the bottom, right? You end up inverting the image that way. So that's, um, that's really all there is to a refracting telescope. You got to cut the lenses just right so that they bend the light right. You put tubes around it so that they're held at the right distance. You can't just have the two lenses be at any arbitrary distance from one another. You have to have it so that the so-called focal length of the two lenses lead you to the same point in space. So the focal length is how long it takes to bend the light down to a point. Like, so the focal length for this objective would be from the location of the objective to that point right there. And then the focal length of the eyepiece depends on how you cut the eyepiece, but however you cut it, and once you know the focal length, you got to make sure that the focal length from the eyepiece would uh, end you up at that same location inside your tube as the focal length from the objective. Then everything is nice and crisp, not blurry. Reflecting telescopes are based off of mirrors. I do have a reflecting telescope in the corner of my room right here. Here's my reflecting telescope. And you can look right down towards through the telescope. You might be able to tell that there's a mirror down there at the bottom of it, right? And so what's going on is that light from far away comes in, goes into the tube of your reflector, comes down and hits the mirror that's at the bottom. And then what happens next depends on what kind of reflecting telescope you have. There are different types. In the diagram you see on your screen, you can see the light gets bounced back up to a secondary mirror, which is up here. And then from there, it gets reflected off to the side of the mirror. Now, in the telescope I have in my corner of the room here, what happens is indeed the light goes and hits the mirror at the base there's a secondary mirror right here. That's why this whole thing is here. But rather than having that secondary mirror shoot the light out the side of the telescope, it sends it straight back down through the center of the tube so that in the end, that light is um, going to be coming out the bottom. And so if I turn this sideways and around, you might be able to see this is where you would put your eyepiece then. The light comes down, hits the mirror at the bottom, hits the secondary mirror at the top, then goes back down. And this is where you would put your eyepiece. That's where you would put your eye looking through there. Or if you weren't looking at it with your eye, you might put your CCD camera or whatever, spectrometer or whatever right there where that eyepiece would go. Now, these reflecting telescopes have a great advantage over refracting telescopes. With a refracting telescope, you can only make the lenses so big before they're just way too much that you can no longer support them from the side. So the biggest refractor you can make has about a one meter diameter. A meter is 39 inches and some change, right? Just a little more than a yard, a little more than three feet. And so you can make, if you tried to make it bigger than that, the lens is so heavy, you cannot support it just from the outside. Now with refracting telescopes, reflecting telescopes, you can support the mirror from underneath. And so you can make the mirrors much, much bigger than you could make a lens. And so that is basically why you have um, an advantage with reflecting telescopes. The other reason that reflecting telescopes are gonna give you a big advantage is because you can do what's called adaptive optics. And I'll mention that a few slides from now. 
But what we're looking at here is uh, one of the Keck telescopes. This is 10 meters across. So it would have 10 squared or 100 times the light gathering area of a one meter telescope. Because you make it both 10 times broader this way and this way. So it's 100 times more light that it could gather. And you might say, oh, well, man, look at all these. It's got arms and a secondary mirror that blocks some of the light and so on. Doesn't that matter? Yeah, it matters a little bit. But that secondary mirror is only blocking some of the light. And it's not like you're going to have an image with part of it missing. Because you're able to see all everything that you're looking at. You might wonder, man, this secondary mirror on that reflecting telescope, why doesn't it block my view? Well, it's kind of like, you know, as long as you're getting light from the object somewhere against your mirror and you're focused in on that far away object and not on the secondary mirror, it doesn't obscure your view. It just allows you to collect slightly less light. You know, if I'm looking through the tree branches out at the mountain, right? And um, if I bob my head to the left and right and up and down, Eventually, I can see all the different parts of the mountain, even though those tree branches were in the way, because I'm looking over a large enough area that those tree branches just don't matter anymore. I can get light from at least somewhere. So if you imagine you have this big aperture collecting light, things in the foreground, you can, in a sense, see right by them. As long as light can make it by those things in the foreground from some and hit some part of your aperture. So, all right. This 10 meter telescope, if you look carefully, is broken up into little segments. You see how there are little hexagonal segments down at the bottom there? And that makes it easier for you if, you know, your mirror cracks or something, you don't have to replace the whole mirror. You just replace the one little segment. Now that, that, that's convenient as well. So the largest telescopes currently have diameters of about 10 meters. There are plans to build larger ones, like the extremely large telescope. Here's the four meter and eight meter telescopes in Chile. Um, it's good to put these kind of telescopes in areas that are high and dry. Why dry? You don't want clouds, obviously. Why high? Well, that's atmospheric absorption of light. And so places like um, the Atacama Desert in Chile, mountaintop ranges in Hawaii, these are kind of ideal places to put telescopes. Now I mentioned angular resolution before. I wanna to return to that and talk a little bit about it. In this interactive figure, I see that there's some light source off in the distance. And at this point, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's a motorcycle, uh, with one headlight. I don't know if it's a car with two headlights, something else. Let's go ahead and, you know, let this play out. It gets closer and closer. And eventually I realize, oh, that's two headlights. You know, before those headlights were close enough together that I wasn't able to tell there was two things. But now once they have a big enough angular separation between the two, um, I can tell there's two headlights. So angular resolution is is gonna give you, um, a, you know, smaller angular resolutions is better. It gives you an idea of how blurry some object's gonna appear. So right now, let's say you have some crappy telescope with poor angular resolution that you're using to look at this binary star system. Those two stars may just look as one star. Their light is blurred together because you've got bad angular resolution, you know? Now I'm gonna make my telescope bigger, bigger, bigger in diameter and look at how it gets more and more crisp of an image. And now I can see very easily that there are two stars. So what happened was the angular resolution got small enough, got smaller than the angular separation of the stars. And then I could tell that there's two distinct individual objects. So making bigger telescopes gives you better angular resolution, gives you crisper images. Now I mentioned adaptive octave as well. This is pretty super cool. It allows us to take into effect and counteract the blurring that naturally occurs due to the atmosphere. Now the atmosphere is not just stagnant air. 
light from objects like stars comes through our atmosphere. And there's little pockets of air that are turbulent moving around in our atmosphere. And the light gets pumped or bumped around by that air as it tries to travel through it. And so if you're looking at some star, you'll see it, uh, you'll see it twinkle. That's because of our own atmosphere. If you get up above the atmosphere of the earth, the stars no longer twinkle. Twinkling of stars is not something inherent to the stars themselves. The twinkling of stars is due to the earth's atmosphere bouncing around the light. And that's bad for an astronomer who wants to make a nice sharp image of something, right? Because the light gets bounced around and then if you're collecting the light, that's gonna make your object blurry. So what do they do? They send out a laser beam. You see it shooting out of the observatory that goes up and hits the high atmosphere and excites some atoms in the upper atmosphere and causes them to glow, effectively making a fake star on the sky. And they make that fake star right next to the real astronomical object that they care about. And now the light from the real astronomical object and your fake star will get bounced around by the same air masses as they come down to your telescope. And so, fine, we now say, well, look, I'm looking at this fake star. I see it's blurry, it's jittering around, but I know that that fake star is supposed to be a perfectly still point of light. And so what do they do? They take those little segments of the mirror at the bottom of the reflecting telescope, and in real time, they adjust it to counteract, to undo the twinkling of the fake star. And at the same time, then, they're going to be sharpening up the image of the real celestial object that's right next to that fake star. And so you can see here a couple examples of the benefits of adaptive optics. In the upper right here, it transitions from a picture that um, had the adaptive optics off to one where it was on. And this is in the center of our galaxy, where there's a black hole four, time, four million times the mass of the sun being orbited by the stars that we're looking at here. And that's blurry, no adaptive optics. Still from the surface of the Earth, same telescope. That's what it looks like once you turn the adaptive optics on. Or down here in the bottom part of the image, you can see without adaptive optics, you got poor angular resolution. With adaptive optics, you can um, undo the effects of that atmospheric turbulence and um, get better angular resolution. I'm just gonna quickly go through the last few sections here. It is worth pointing out that you have telescopes that can observe in all different wavelength regimes. So the radio telescope in Arecibo just went offline, unfortunately, when one of the cables snapped and uh, it became unstable and broke some of the dish and then it, 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 um, it, uh, it deteriorated more after that and they decided to uh, decommission this radio telescope. But what is it? It's this big dish nestled in Puerto Rico. You have other radio telescopes that exist. Um, the physics department at Allegheny College has a dish over there in the garden, the garden next to Carr Hall, where uh, you can use this big dish to detect radio waves from space. Physics majors in the department use that for some of their senior projects. These telescopes need to be bigger because remember radio waves are real long wavelength light. So you need big dishes to be able to reflect them and then pick up the signal. You can learn a lot by using radio telescopes. In section 6.5, you talk about how important it is to have telescopes in space. It's true that we can get away with adaptive optics and that it helping us with angular resolution, even with ground-based telescopes, and that's great technology. But remember things like infrared radiation, ultraviolet radiation, X-rays, gamma rays, they're all absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere. So nothing short of putting telescopes up above the Earth's atmosphere will help you to do observations in those wavelength regimes. 
you don't put telescopes in space because they're closer to the stars or other objects you're looking at. They're only up there, you know, 100, 200 miles above the surface of the Earth. That is utterly negligible compared to the distances to the objects they're looking at. The reason that you put the telescopes in space is to get them up above the Earth's atmosphere so that you don't have those absorption effects. And then, of course, you won't also have the turbulence from the atmosphere, so that's another nice benefit. Just a few more words about the last section of chapter six. We were talking about the future of astronomical observations. We mentioned real briefly the extremely large telescope, which is a telescope being built in Chile. Uh, it should be done by 2025. That's when we hope to have first light from it. And uh, that telescope is going to be uh, really large. I think it's 30 meters in diameter, whereas the biggest telescope to date is only 10 meters in diameter. The James Webb Space Telescope is scheduled to launch on Halloween this year, so fingers crossed. It's going to have a primary mirror that you see here that's six and a half meters in diameter. For comparison, Hubble Space Telescope is 2.4 meters, so it's going to collect a lot more light. That's going to allow for sharper images. That's going to allow you to see things at farther distances. And remember, as you see things that are farther away, you're looking back further in time. And so we'll be able to see back earlier in the evolution of the universe. Now, Hubble Space Telescope orbits around the Earth. JWST is going to orbit around the sun. And you can see here that it's got this shield at the bottom. The idea is that as it orbits, that shield, which is about the size of a tennis court, will face inward toward the sun and protect the telescope from light from the sun. And so the telescope will be able to remain colder because of that. You won't have that um, light also that could uh, scatter off of some of the arms and maybe interfere a little bit with the uh, observations. And so that shield will really help us to get sharp, crisp, detailed images. You see the mirrors there have that gold tint to it. In fact, they're plated in gold. Gold reflects infrared radiation quite effectively. And so that will help with JWST's infrared observations. It's gonna be able to observe in a few different wavelengths, including infrared and um, visible. How can they test that it won't melt from the heat from the sun because they can't replicate the temperature here on earth? Um, you know, then it's not gonna be that, I, I, it's a good question but it's not going to be that close to the sun. In a sense, if you neglect the amount of light that's absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere, this is going to be hit on each square meter up in space with just as much sunlight as it would down here on Earth. It's really not that hot in space. In fact, if anything, it's colder. But this takes into account that this is going to be orbiting the sun at the Earth's orbital radius it's going to be orbiting one astronomical unit away. So we're not going to be, it's not going to be in close to the sun orbiting. Yes, that would be hot. It's going to be nice and far out away where the flux of sunlight is the same as it is here on Earth. All right, well, that's it for chapter six. In chapter seven, we're going to give you that brief overview of our own solar system. And we're going to be talking about the planets and their moons in chapters 8 and 9 and 10, right? So this is just a quick survey of what there is in the solar system.